Welcome to the Explore Words Discover Worlds podcast, presented by Bradford Literature Festival. In this episode, we commemorate the 50th anniversary of Pablo Picasso's passing and delve into why he continues to inspire artists around the world. Recorded at the 2023 Bradford Literature Festival, this episode features renowned poets Anthony Anaxagoru, Aviva Deutsch and Sana Asan as they explore Picasso's remarkable legacy and share their ecstatic poetry inspired by his works. Uh, hello, I'm Dave Haslam. I'm uh, chairing the panel uh, this lunchtime. Um, uh, thank you all for coming. It's a nice, uh, good turnout. Uh, so the format for the next hour and a quarter, which is quite a long time, hour and a quarter, we'll manage that. If your stomach start rumbling, then you're not mic'd up, so don't get all self-conscious about it. Um, uh, the way we're going to do it is I'm going to introduce, maybe for 10 or 15 minutes, um, talking about Picasso in a very general way. Um, I can't capture his entire life story, uh, obviously, in that 10 minutes, but just a bit of an intro. And then uh, we're going to meet each of the poets um, in turn uh, who are responding to a particular uh, Picasso painting of their choice or work of their choice. So each of the poets will uh, talk about their poem and read their poem, and we'll have a little bit of a discussion as to uh, any, any of the issues uh, raised uh, in, in their individual slot. And then we'll have a general discussion about Picasso, hopefully involving yourselves. And uh, that'll take us through till about four o'clock. Great. Um, okay. So uh, um, I'm... Uh, among the many things that I've done is I've authored this series of uh, short format books. And the series is called Art Decades. And uh, they're on various subjects, including uh, Keith Haring. Uh, the book is about his uh, relationship to New York nightlife uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, Courtney Love, who was in Liverpool in 1982 uh, for six months. And the story is about what Courtney got up to then, obviously pre-Kurt, pre-Nirvana, pre-rock and roll. Um, uh, a book about... Uh, the Angry Brigade, urban terrorists from uh, the early 70s in Britain. And uh, I discovered they lived in a squat in Moss Side for a while and took a lot of LSD. And uh, so that piqued my interest. And um, they also tried to blow up the Italian consul in Manchester, uh, which they failed to do. And I don't know if their consumption of LSD and their failure to blow up the Italian consul are connected, but possibly. Um, a book about vinyl collecting um, and the book uh, about Picasso, which is, came out last month, which is called Adventure Everywhere, Pablo Picasso's Paris Nightlife. Um, I'll just quickly, uh, as I say, tell the story of Picasso, but maybe in relation to that book, because the point of my books is I choose a snapshot from people's life, a very specific theme. Uh, obviously, Picasso was 91 when he died, uh, and there's massive three-volume biographies to be bought. So my, instead, my, uh, the way that I approach it is, to, is, as I say, a snapshot, a theme. And it's really about the relationship between his life and work and what was going on in Paris after dark. One of the reasons for that is I'm particularly interested in how nightlife... Uh, affects artists. You know, often in the history of art, we hear about how other artists are influencing other artists. It's all seen as a kind of linear canon of art. Um, but Picasso spent more time in a cabaret bar called the Lapin Agile than he did at the Louvre. So I'm kind of wondering, well, what did those kind of experiences, how did that affect his work? He arrived in Paris in 1900, uh, on the, on the, around the time of his 19th birthday. If you know his story, you'll know he'll, he arrived there with his friend Casa Hamas. 
Um, and, you know, they were, they were strangers in Paris, and it was at a time when Paris was the centre of European, for sure, European art, but it was also a really thriving and intense nightlife city. And the two young Spaniards threw themselves into the nightlife. Uh, so they were mixing with all kinds of reprobates, bandits, ladies of the night, drug dealers. I didn't know, but Picasso was into his opium, and I found out which bar he went to in order to score. So that's a bit of information you don't get from all the art biographies. Um, so they went to cabaret clubs, they went to a, a nightlife venue called L'Enfer, which if you know your French translates as hell, uh, which was a kind of hell-themed nightclub, basement nightclub. Um, and also they went to the circus, which if you're a fan of Picasso's work, you'll know that uh, he does paint, especially in that early period around 1903, 1904, the so-called pink period, he did paint a lot of... Uh, circus performers. He kind of related to them on, on quite a deep level. I talk about cafe bars. I'm very interested in the way that certain locations in our cities become almost like petri dishes or catalysts for activity. Uh, and cafe bars is, is kind of is, is an example of that. Somewhere where people gather and they collaborate possibly. In the generation before Picasso, the Impressionists congregated a, a, a cafe bar called Nouvelle Athènes. Uh, and it was, and, uh, in fact, some theorists say that Impressionism wouldn't have happened if cafe bars hadn't existed because there wasn't a social space for people like Manet and Degas and Van Gogh to meet. So I'm interested in that. I'm interested in those locations. So I talk about that in the Picasso book. So... When we come to cubism, the iconography of cubism is all items taken from the world that I explore. You know, it, for Picasso in, uh, and Braque in 1913, 1912, 13, 14, they weren't painting clouds or a bridge over the river Seine. They were painting absinthe bottles, guitars. You know, they'd go out listening to, to music in bars. Uh, glasses of wine. Uh, they paint uh, newspaper clippings, and in, in that period, you go to the cafe bar to read the newspaper. Uh, so the, uh, all the iconography of Cubism uh, comes from those kind of locations, cafe bars, cabaret clubs, nightlife. Um, so I'm luckily, my theory of following Picasso's uh, the influence of nightlife on Picasso kind of came to fruition really in that Cubist period. Uh, obviously, Picasso, as he became more famous and wealthier, he moved away from Montmartre, where he'd, he'd, he'd lived for uh, um, Montmartre and Pigalle, where he'd lived for the first 12 years of his time in Paris. And he, he did kind of upgrade his houses, you know, uh, in, in a kind of real proper location, location, location kind of a way. And he ended up in some of the very bourgeois posh areas of Paris. And he also, his nightlife obviously changed at that point. He started going to uh, clubs where he'd mix with the aristocracy and he'd mix with the wealthy kind of art world jet setters and he'd hang out with Coco Chanel. So he kind of went from hanging out with bandits, dancers, painters and poets to hanging out with... Uh, the, the, the rich and famous, and I would say to the detriment of his art. Controversial point, but there we go. He also hung out, he also lost contact in that period with uh, important people in his life, one of them being Guillaume Apollinaire, who, the poet who he had spent a lot of time with um, in his first 15 years um, in Paris. The book is called Adventure Everywhere. It's actually a quote from Apollinaire. Um, uh, and he uses the phrase adventure everywhere to talk about not just the idea of adventuring through life or adventuring through nightlife, but he talked about the radical mindset which he believed that artists should have, and he believed that Picasso was one of these people who had a radical, challenging mindset. Uh, so the adventure everywhere was also about where you find your influences, 
how you move on, how you're anti-nostalgia, how you're pushing your boundaries personally and culturally. So the book starts with the young Spaniard adventuring around nightlife, but then talks about how his radical mindset meant he was also adventuring through different forms, different colors, different formats, uh, different stages of his life. Um, I also talk about the uh, issue which uh, I, I know we've already had a panel about, which is about uh, his problematic attitudes to uh, certain things, including his misogyny. Uh, obviously, in a short format book, you're not able to deal with all those issues, but one of the points that I try to make through the book is that when I mention some of the women in Picasso's life, I don't talk about them as uh, a muse, as a kind of a passive um, model for Picasso that he would just use and who wouldn't necessarily contribute uh, to the cultural world of Paris. So somebody like Dora Ma, for example, uh, I treat uh, her as she indeed was, as an uh, intellectual equal of Picasso's. She was more politically savvy than Picasso. She was a surrealist photographer of, of, of great talent in her own right. Um, so that is obviously, again, something uh, that we might end up talking about. So that's just a, a, a brief summary of a few of the themes in my book and a few themes that we, we may be talking about um, uh, in the next hour. Um, and I'll do a short reading from the book at the very um, end of the session. So I wonder if the, the poets can, uh, as I say, take it in turns to let us hear their poem and to talk about why they picked the painting that they picked and uh, the processes that they went through. So who am I going to start with? Anthony's got his on the phone. Yeah, I've got. I was, I was looking. <coughs> um, I lost mine, which I was on the phone for a, a beginning. I wasn't doing emails. So I was uh, <coughs> trying to find the poem. So I, I'm, I did the old guitarist that he painted in um, between 1903 and 1904. <coughs> I, I found out uh, it, was, it was interesting when you don't know much about a painter's life, but you know their paintings, like how you respond to it, um, which I kind of was using you know like Max Porter wrote the thing on Francis Bacon um, and when I asked Max about the book he said he didn't really know much about Francis Bacon he just kind of amassed an idea from little snippets that he'd read online and created this like montage of trying to reflect his life so I kind of had a go at doing the same thing with uh, with this I did find out that Wallace Stevens also wrote a poem that was in response to the painting um, in the mid 20th century so that was interesting. Um, I, have, they, have you got the painting in front of you? Have you guys? Do you know what I'm talking? About? You're right. Yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah. Um, if, if, if you can't get the painting up on the thing, can you? No, is it? <laughs> um, all right. Would you like to? Would you, would you like to describe the painting? Do you need to de maybe describe the yeah, painting descri quickly? Describe, yeah, describe the painting. So describe the painting. As a poet, go on. Wow. Well, <laughs> so in rhyming couplets. <laughs> yeah. Starting now. I do. I do um, a Sistina actually. Um, it's a. So it's it's, it's a. Oh, you can't even see it. There you go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's an old man who's uh, very frail, um, who's holding a guitar, but it's so blue. Like it's so like devoid of, of any kind of life or virility that it really struck. The only actual colourful thing that sticks out is the guitar, which I found I found really interesting. I was also drawn to his angularity. There's something that also resembles kind of there's a Jesus element to it as well. It's very gaunt, kind of like a step toe and son figure. Um, but yeah, just th there's something really biblical about the way that he holds the guitar almost like a cross, which I found quite interesting long lean fingers um, and just this very gaunt kind of passive almost dead like um, posture with the guitar being the most kind of erect um, which I thought was really interesting as a juxtaposition um, for kind of m mortality um, and frailty and poverty as well I found out when I did I wrote the poem and then I did my kind of reading up on what Picasso was doing and it was about it might be I might have misremembered, but about a friend of his who died, who was a musician, um, and it was kind of, an, I guess, an elegy to, to kind of to him. So this is called Blue Guitar Old Man, and it is in couplets, um, albeit not rhyming ones. 
Um, Drooped in its year, a rude crucifix drained of weight. His lowness, its manifesto, anemic and splintered. Discord reaching for the harsher strokes of an old man's unbending. Two trades of confession. Who here can play the epicenter of his terror? A torn femur, a mule's genius bearing the thirst a penny saves for its well. The hollow of a guitar sings to both grave and womb. Old man, look back at me. Unpick your life, your language for purpose here. A small score to push in to resolve before we go one more sustained note for the next movement's blue turn. Mm. <laughs> Come on. As I said, I think it would be good, interesting to discuss each poem as we hear it, rather than trying to remember them all to the end. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there anything that any, either of the other poets would like to say about this, or anyone in the audience uh, in response? I mean, I mean, I mean you, sorry, yes? I don't know if he was in the middle of that, but I think how old was he when he was writing this? Oh, no, he, was he wasn't, yeah, 1902. Yeah, he was in the very early 20s, yeah. and... Yeah. Uh, he, I mean, uh, his friend Casa Hamus, who, uh, that he'd arrived in Paris with in 1900, killed himself in 1901, and that yeah. triggered the Blue Period, which is that, that's very much. Yeah, in like me, it's, it's, yeah, it's really, it's quite sterile. We were talking about sterility earlier, and it's got a very sterile kind of emptiness to it. That blue, I don't know, it's really striking. Like it really got me. Like it's like aquatic, wa it's like aquatic, like it's watery, but at the same time, it's like a dead water, you know? Like when you respond to this, I guess from a synesthetic kind of level as well, like you're having a real experience with the composition, the colors, the tones, and trying to find the language. Like the Havoc Frasis poetry, that I think tries to do it. But I think Derek Walcott does Ekphrasis really, really well, where you don't kind of just describe it, you find something within the tones and the textures that the language can articulate. Um, or kind of even in a tableau, like, you know, someone like John Ashbury, this kind of collage of, of kind of ideas, uh, like, yeah, it's, that's what I was trying to do with it. Mm -mm. Mm. Yeah, and, and I think that's, like, what Anthony does so well in terms of using language to birth new ideas uh, and kind of taking, for example, you know, the blue guitar and we, we end at the blue turn where we're birthed with a new idea. Um, and, you know, kind of the... The there were certain lines that stayed with, stayed with me, kind of the man unbending, kind of that rigidity, and the hollowness that we might assume with the kind of physicality of the guitar becomes something else, becomes a different kind of hollow. Um, and I don't think anyone really does it better, to be honest. Cheers, man. He, yeah, so man. Do you want to blurb my next book? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah but I think the guitar was interested <laughs> in, in the photo because it, it was the only thing that had life. And I was looking at you know, how hollow the guitar is, and the idea that we're born in kind of hollowness in mm. between this. Mm. I think um, Cornel West talks about the idea we're born between urine and feces. Um, and like, I mean, it's a visceral image, right? But it, as a phrase, it's just like, it's quite potent in how we come into the world. Mm. And this, this old man, the last thing he's left holding as a kind of crutch is, is this guitar that just looks so full of life in comparison to everything else in the painting. Mm -hmm. yeah, I uh, yeah, I really like that, that uh, the analysis of that the deadness of the blue, mm -hmm. um, because that that was really that was really key to that that period, I think, in in Picasso. But also, he he was very interested in. I mean, his his political views. Uh, I, I don't think were, were were ever kind of really properly. He, he responded emotionally really to issues that we might call political, and I think in that period he was also very interested in the poverty that you saw around in, in Paris. There's a lot of, and, and the, the poverty-stricken figures turn into emaciated yeah. figures, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. which is where you get the sense of suffering. Yeah. You get well, it's the got a Jesus-like feel. Yeah. That it's really, mm. like, it, it's very emblematic of, like, a Jesus kind of symbol that yeah. I, felt, I thought was really interesting as well. It's hard to place how old the old man <laughs> was. Like, I was trying to work out where would you put him? 80s, kind of, but it's difficult to kind of I mean, in, in yeah, 1903, a man of my age would have been an old man, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 63, <laughs> would have, 61 would have been... End of life. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, the, 
the, the relationship between Picasso and guitar has obviously really fascinated me. It's a lot written about in the book. Um, and uh, it's interesting because you actually used, the, in your intro, you used the word erect in terms of the guitar. Later on in, in Picasso's life, it, uh, guitars became very, very symbolic of woman. Oh, interesting. Right, to yeah. the point, you know, the, the, the curves, um, uh, the, the, the where the, the, the central hole of the guitar is. Yeah. And he used, you know, he, he very much used it as a, as a symbol of, of yeah. uh, womanhood. Is that what you were trying to do? That's with the with the. <laughs> I, I don't want to say the hole because that sounds <laughs> quite crude. But yeah, like well, the, the Picasso the was a crude man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Mm. I was really interested. To th I was thinking about how it might look on the page because you said it was written in couplets and the kind of struts of the guitar yeah. and the frets and that kind of yeah, like you're jazzily mm. playing <coughs> that shape. It felt with the power. Yeah, and it's mm. quite short, and I wanted to almost feel like one chord. So yeah. if you were to just strike one chord, how would that come across, rather than have mm. like a whole you know thing going on? So mm. yeah, I was I was really thinking about the the fretboard and things like that when it came to the mm. to the playing. I think Jeremy had yeah. a question. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. a question. Yeah. Hi, Jeremy. Um, yeah. Th uh, thanks for the the poem, Anthony. And and uh, we've just been sitting here looking at, at the painting here. Um, and what you were saying about, you know, there being a kind of Christ-like aspect to the to the old man, and what Dave was saying about, you know, there being an association with femininity in the shape of the guitar and Picasso's work, it was occurring to me that there's something. Well, two things. One is that Picasso does these portraits of people sort of tilting their heads when they're paying attention, really beautifully. Like there's a sketch of a man rolling a cigarette, his head is sort of on one side, like he's really thinking about it. Um, or uh, a, a female acrobat who's breastfeeding is also kind of in that posture. But in terms of art history, I feel like there's a sort of inversion of the Pieta um, symbolism of, of Mary, the Virgin Mary holding the body of the dead Christ. It's the other way around. It's like the, the, the almost dead body of the man kind of being cradled by the guitar. Yeah. Um, th yeah, so yeah. That, that was... Yeah, sorry, a comment, not a question. <laughs> <laughs> I should have made clear, no comments, just questions. Um, uh, we will move on sh shortly. Is there anyone? I mean, we can come to all these things, obviously, right at the end as well. Yeah. Uh, with Picasso being uh, Catalan, the guitar is a symbol of Spain, really, because yeah. it's all the flamenco and all that. It's, it's part of Spain. So uh, I'm sure that's why he had uh, guitars absolutely. a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Uh, 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 just to make sure you all heard that. Yeah, um, d uh, about Picasso being Catalan and the importance of, of, of flamenco. I mean, not mm -hmm. just as a guitar, but as a culture. Yes. And um, Picasso, because one of the things that frustrated me when I was researching, writing about his life, uh, which I, but I understood, was he used to say the only music he really loved was flamenco. Okay, all through his life. And he lived in the, he lived in the 20s and the flowering of jazz in Paris. You know, he could have hung out with Miles Davis in the 1950s. He could have been one of the great jazz painters of all time. And it kind of frustrates me that despite living for 91 years, he never really ever responded to, to jazz, which I think is probably the nearest form to art that, we have, that we've ever had. But flamenco was a part of him. But also, I, th it was, I think also he liked to feel like he hadn't lost his roots. So he'd be somewhere in Paris, ha hanging out with Coco Chanel. There'd be a jazz trio playing in the corner, which would probably be now legendary historic jazz trio. And he'd be like, oh, no, flamenco. Yeah. It's the voice of the people. Yeah. And I think that's how he, 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 he saw flamenco. Yeah, mm. yeah that's a lovely point. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. And Lucia. Yeah. 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 In yeah. fact, he, 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 when he went back to Andalusia and he wanted to learn, he belatedly in his life tried to learn guitar. It was like something that in his later years he said, you know, he didn't want to die without having learned how to play flamenco guitar. Can I ask you a question? Are they going to put these poems online so folk can read them? Is that. 
But they're making what? they're making animations. I'm making a film. Yeah. 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 There's a film coming, you lot. So mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> with all this in. No, no, no. We'll, we'll go for everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah let, let, let's go through everyone else, and we'll <laughs> listen to the poems again at the end. Sure. In like a grand finale. <laughs> all right. Uh, Sana, would you like to? Sure. Um, yeah. So I actually came to Picasso being someone not that familiar with both the artist and me, like Anthony was saying, with, with the artist, but also not knowing that much of Picasso's work, which maybe some of you might be really shocked to, <laughs> to hear. Um, so really, I, I, entered, I entered the invitation from a place of just really seeing what came up for me from just from the image. Um, and having, I guess, some, some context to kind of the problematic <laughs> parts of, of Picasso's life and also that he really worked with a lot of themes of loneliness and despair and isolation. Um, and I think, you know, on some level, maybe that shaped my point of entry. So I, my response was to the acrobat, not the 1930s painting. Is anyone here familiar with that painting? Yeah, well, I, I'll try, I'll describe it. It would have been great to have them, to be honest, but it, it's kind of like, it's like a, a, a bit like, similarly, like a, you were talking about this emaciated kind of image. It's like a contorted, body, a contorted figure um, that has no, f no features, it's like a surrealist image, con completely contorted in, in a boxed frame, uh, and the image is, is a white, white body, and I think because of that contortion, you know, it, it might be a woman, but it's also that it's, it, it could, there could be a genderlessness to it, or kind of a gender fluidity, um, so yeah, so that, that was the painting, and I, um, I guess my my reaction to it. Maybe I'll read the poem and then explain. Is that, is that? Yeah, of course. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. Um, yeah. So this poem is called, Is Depression and Anger Turned Inwards? Everyone I love wants more, and my piss is copper. The toilet roll finished last Monday, just before the radio announced 300 Pakistanis were packed below deck into a death made reasonable by immigration policies. A toothy sea stretches itself towards yesterday's news. From the safety of my bed, I'm prizing open a white tulip, shouting on love that isn't. Like God gouging a slow Friday for gratitude. It's been a year since last summer, and rage is still a Gucci coat I can't afford to wear. Honey, point that hot arrow back inwards. Merc a juicy gut. It's raining blue ticks and kindness is on the other side of the equator. Interiority splayed across screens whilst the watchers shovel popcorn. We've been watched into watching. Hypervigilance thumbs a heart. It feels red. I can't smell my own blood. From here, liberation is pitying us, balled up over immortality's theatre. Fuck, I broke my own knee by mistake, or was it yours? All this unacknowledged hurt is rotting in the back garden. Who hasn't listened to the low murmur of a pulse knocking after a few weeks of morning's chubby heat? I am copy and pasting myself, like sweaty headlines in another room, another land, a two-year-old lays face down on the shore, sneakers on tiny feet. I worry this life is wasted on me. That's it. You kept Thank it. you, Thank you, you kept it. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I, I guess, um, you know, just the title starting with, you know, is depression and anger turned inwards? Understanding that um, a, deep, a state of deep, deep sadness, um, at, or what some people might language as depression, can often be understood as, as an unexpressed rage. You know, if we haven't got places to put our anger, that can be turned, turned inwards. And I think with, with Picasso's image of that, that contorted body, um, thinking of the ways that we are entrapped by our unexpressed emotionality um, was, was one, one of the points of entry for me. And I think also, 
you know, think, uh, you know this the whole play on, on social media, which I think you could, could really hear in the poem, is how we are, um, yeah, I guess in some ways incarcerated by the gaze of other, you know, I was thinking about kind of free movement in the poem, both from, from that lens of how social media, um, yeah, entraps us. We're entrapped and kind of held hostage by the gaze of others and how dehumanizing and lonely a place that can be. But also, you know, thinking about, um, I wanted to kind of de-individualize suffering a bit too, thinking about that our, how much our sadness is um, and our disembodiment can sometimes be tied up with what's happening for others and in the wider world, you know. Thinking about what that, the travesty, you know, the murder of what happened to refugees in that, on that boat, you know, recently and what can be sometimes forgotten or the stories that are often forgotten and felt really important to mark how many Pakistanis were lost, um, you know, in that incident. And also, you know, really kind of marking, I use the language of, of reasonable there, thinking about kind of um, how, how brutality is made reasonable through documentation, through kind of policy, and wanting to acknowledge that. And I think, um, yeah, I've realized I'm now I'm just talking about the poem and not really talking about Picasso, but what I wanted to, to also, I guess, highlight was that there's something about the image, the, the, the acrobat image that speaks to, to also disembodiment um, and how in the ways that we're invited to engage in social media is a real disconnection from our bodies. You know, there's, there's some lines that I reference in kind of, I can't smell my own blood. You know, I, I can't hear the, the murmur of my pulse that this is, we are, we are more attuned or touch more, we touch, the limb we touch the most is our phones, right? We, we're so disconnected from the rich information that our bodies have for us. And so there was also me wanting to bring that in. Um, that I'm not sure if that's what Picasso was trying to do in it with his painting, but that's the point of entry that I came in. Do you know what's really, I, what's really interesting as you were talking, I read, have you guys read Brian Dillon's new book? It's called Affinities. Mm -hmm. Like, he's great. He, I, I really love him. And he's got this line in the book as you were talking where he says, paintings, poems paint the world, paintings describe it. <laughs> and mm -hmm. and it really it kind of talks into what you were doing because we looked at that poem and we yeah, we yeah. looked at the the painting and I think one of the things that, and I think you touched on it as well when you said jazz gets quite close but I mm. think actually and looking at <coughs> particularly like the New York school and their relationship to kind of to paintings like it, you can create this collegistic sensibility that mm. is very non sequitur because I think one of the things with a painting you don't really know where it begins or where it ends. Mm. And I think poems are very much like that. Whereas a song has a, a physical start and a physical end. Mm -hmm. Whereas paintings, I, I guess if you're looking at the top of the page or the bottom, that's your only way. Of, but a painting, where does it begin and where does it end? Mm -hmm. So I think that really, for me, captured mm -hmm. a lot of those kind of moves, techniques that painting mm -hmm. employs that mm -hmm. you reflected in the poem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's interesting how often, I mean, Picasso loved going to the circus. He loved acrobats. There was a circus called the Cirque Madrano, mm -hmm. which was on the edge of Montmartre, and it was literally 30 yards from one of his homes. Mm -hmm. He'd go two or three times a week. Um, and, uh, but, and he liked the entertainment, and he liked hanging out with acrobats, and they'd all go for a drink after mm -hmm. a performance. But so many of his paintings of acrobats had, that, had a kind of tragic mm -hmm. quality about them. You know, almost, um, almost beyond tears of a clown, mm -hmm. I mean, beyond that idea, but trying to see, s but seeing some kind of emptiness in their life. Mm -hmm. Partly also, I think, due to the, the transience of their life, that they'd be traveling mm -hmm. from place to place. They were home, in, 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 in a major way, homeless, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because they'd go from circus to circus to circus, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. they'd be carrying their national identity with them. Mm -hmm. to a certain extent mm -hmm. um, and they were with ad hoc groups of friends mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for a limited amount of time yeah. and he seemed to really relate to that as yeah. somebody who was an ex exiled himself from his own country mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah yeah I, I think it's really interesting because I think that that kind of concept of acrobatics I think what I wanted to really also bring alive in the poem is how differently that applies for different marginalized bodies Wh quite literally the, the movements for survival you know, to, 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 to avoid murder, essentially, and, and how for kind of our current, sort of, well, Gen Z kind of <laughs> generation, how, how that happens from the safety of a bed, how we, we kind of are, 
our acrobatics are kind of on in these it's social media kind of online platforms where there's st oppression is still at play and we're still we try we're still trying to touch into what an imagining of freedom might be but with these with the privileges i guess of of safety and and wanting to kind of to capture that and i think it's interesting thinking about um how we can hold those complexities for an artist like picasso who had experiences of exile, but also was very complicit and upheld brutality over others, mm. upheld brutality over women. You know, mm. if we th if we relook at that image of, of the acrobat, you know, and we do imagine her as a woman, and we see the square box as his gaze, you know, that, that actually there's something about how he, he, there was he was also upholding mm. um, oppression and kind of yeah restriction over others as well as having experienced that too. Mm. The question that I, can I just say, like, how would you tell the difference between what the painter is expressing or what the com or the comment the painter is trying to make? So, for instance, if we were to interpret that as Picasso saying, "I control the woman," no, yeah. or <laughs> is the comment the woman in society is controlled, and mm. I'm trying to do you see what I'm right, saying? Right, like, at what right. point do you? Yeah, because I mean, there's a paint, there's a painting of of Dora Maar from I think 1938. Dora Maar was. Um, uh, you know, a, a long-term uh, lover and sufferer in the arms of, of Picasso. And the painting I is her crying. And the, the comment is often, especially in more recent years, about him, in a way, glorifying her suffering. Mm. That he's so distant from that experience that she's... She's crying because of him, yeah, yeah. Mm. and he steps back and just paints it, yeah. and then sells the so painting. So it's disassociation. <laughs> now, for yeah. Picasso, he said mm. his view of that painting was she's crying tears for what's happening in Spain in the Civil War mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and in the world politically. Mm. So he, he um, obviously, painters paint with an unconscious so there's a disassociation, well. you're saying? And the, the dislocation between his conscious eye and mm. his unconscious mm -hmm, eye mm -hmm. in a painting like that yeah. is, is, is huge. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, mm. Aviva, would you like to...? Yeah, I mean, before I do, though, I think you've raised questions that I... As you'll see, my poem is trying to explore that relationship between con what is conscious, what is unconscious, what we see, how we're seen. Mm -hmm. But also, I thought it was really interesting hearing Sana, because what you're kind of doing is like owning it, mm -hmm. you know, standing up and going, this painting is for me too, and mm -hmm. claiming it. And that's like such a strong statement that mm -hmm. is transformative. You know, it kind of doesn't matter what we've given if we can still see it and choose how we view. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that like I'm confident in saying that. Um, but this was the hardest commission I've ever had. And I've, I'm coming to saying that after about, I don't know how long it is, three, four, I think even more, maybe five months of wrestling. Um, because I didn't quite choose my painting. And now hearing Dave talk, I realise why the painting I was given is the one I was given. Um, so the commission came in terms of, we, were we are writing these because they're going to become visual film poems. And Saima, who I'm sure many of you know, who's the di director of the festival, phoned me up and she said her favourite poem is Blue Nude um, from 1902, which is a woman seen from her back. So although it is blue, it's the same period as the guitar painting that Anthony was talking about and it's actually slightly earlier it's just after Kastachemus committed suicide and he did so because he actually shot the woman he loved first um, he proposed to her and she turned him down and he shot her and then himself and she survived but he didn't but one of the reasons that has been posited for her rejecting him is that she'd also slept with Picasso so there's, there's, there's a lot of grief in Picasso's paintings after Castor Hamas' death, this blue period. And this is the first painting of a woman that he does after that. And it's a nude woman, but it's from the back, so we don't know who she is. So Simon said, 
have a look at this painting, you know, and I now realise because it fits in with the whole Paris period that we're talking about. So I'm a queer woman and I looked at it and I saw the grief, but I also saw how erotic it was. And it's really compelling and kind of, I felt like she's there to project fantasies onto. You know, there is always that mixture, isn't there, of eros and thanatos, of grief and death and love. Um, and that's what I felt was there. But I also had in the back of my mind, um, I'm sure many of you have seen the Hannah Gadsby um, comments about Picasso. She's just curated a show actually based on him, kind of critiquing him for his attitudes towards women. Um, and I couldn't just look at her from the back. So I went to the Picasso Museum in Barcelona because there's a companion painting um, which shows, and we don't know for definite that it's same, the same model, but it probably is from the front. And the thing that got me was how young she was. So here had I been like eroticizing this woman and actually seeing if it is the same woman from the front. She's very young. And this was the period, again, we're not sure if this is who it was, but there was a period where he brought home from an orphanage a 13-year-old. Not He didn't sexually abuse her, but he was drawing her um, and drawing her naked. So I kind of, I got really thrown and I was like, I can't do this, actually. I don't want to do this painting. I don't want to do this. Um, I'm going to find my own. And I went away from it completely. Um, and I went to a different Picasso. Because um, the Picasso I knew and the Picasso I'd always been interested by was the political Picasso. Um, the Picasso of Guernica, um, about the Spanish Civil War. But for me, um, I'm Jewish, children, a grandchild of refugees. And in 1945, he did a Holocaust painting, the Charnel House. And then he did a series of lithographs on the bull, that other great Spanish symbol, completely deconstructing it. There's 11, one after another, where it starts with a beautiful chiaroscuro kind of animal in all its physicality and flesh and strips right down to the line drawing. And I thought, they're making political statements and I'm comfortable with that. So I actually, I went off and I wrote a whole different poem about the 11 bull lithographs. And then, sorry, this is a long story, but I want to explain how I came to it. I, um, I went to Petworth. There was just a recent exhibition of Picasso and Lee Miller. I don't know if anyone know, but during um, the 30s and 40s, he befriended Lee Miller, who initially was a model for Vogue, but then became a foreign correspondent. Um, and she was one of the people, first people to photograph Dachau. And there is this amazing picture of the two of them meeting each other. And he actually really promoted her journalism and her work, and they were in conversation. And I looked at it and I thought, for all my queasiness about Picasso and women, here was a man who championed and respected and raised the voice of woman artists and talked to them about serious issues as equals. Um, it's all complicated, right? And I thought, you know, probably that resistance is doing something. Um, so I'm not going to avoid it. You know, we avoid what's hard, but that's sometimes what you've got to push through. Um, so I went back to the original commission. Um, the original Blue News, and I said, I've got to get out of my head, because if we write, for me anyway, if I write with intentionality, where I'm trying to make a, some kind of political statement, quite often it becomes polemic rather than poetry. And I really admire you for like managing to do it in poetry. Um, so the way I use to kind of trick myself out of that and let myself be surprised and have that kind of magic of being open, is I use form. Um, and at the time that Picasso, 
is there experimenting. And this is just on the edge before he pushes into cubism. You know, the blue and the rose period is still quite naturalistic, but he's influenced by Gauguin, and he's, he's, he's imagining what it could be like to be on the edge of something more creative. So what's happening in poetry in France at the time is exactly that. Victor Hugo and Baudelaire had brought the pan pantoum form from Malaysia to France. And you have all these French poets experimenting with this form. So I thought, well, that's what I do. I'll give myself a form. It connects, because it's of the period, but it's a structure to push against myself. So that was what was going on. Um, and then it turned into a poem <laughs> because it followed the form that was really about all of that and nothing to do with any of it. But <laughs> that's how poems happen. Uh -huh. So I'll read this. And for those who don't know, the pantoums are a repetitive form where lines and phrases come back again and again. Um, I've not done it completely formally where there's rhyme and there's, it's always the set line. I've been a little bit experimental. I've tried to take that Picasso edge of kind of form and freedom and what happens to abstract it a little bit. So this is Blue Nude, um, Picasso, 1902. When I view her nude back floating in its sea of blue, I think of how scientists teach us that the body is almost all water. And a poet I love says it's the shape of grief, fog turning to mist, storing and summoning. I think of how scientists teach us that our bodies are made up of trillions of cells, each capable of growth, of grief, of storing our memories, of summoning responses to stimuli, of reproducing. How each of us is made up, each capable of growth, of reflecting from a thousand different facets, cubists, transforming in response to stimuli, to light. How each of us is a painter, reproducing our vision of life. How each of us is a muse, a die landing by chance on a different facet, shaped by the throw of a hand, that hand carving a brush through air, producing a vision of life. We are seen from behind in ways we can never know, our eyes facing only forward, weighing the throw of our hands, how they carve the air. And air, like our bodies, is almost all water, and the shape of our eyes is the shape of grief, for we can never know her, although we view her nude back floating in its sea of blue. I mean, not to be too formulaic, is there anybody who, who wants to jump in at this point and talk um, about Aviva's poem before I do? <laughs> 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 um, uh, I, I, what, what I really liked was the, the a kind of universality that comes out of a very specific vision. Mm -hmm. um, I really liked the idea of, I think the idea of growth as, mm -hmm. a, as a result of stimuli is mm -hmm. very, somehow it's I think very much about the artistic process as well as, mm -hmm. as you say, everyone is a painter, as well as our evolution as... Mm -hmm human beings, in mm -hmm. fact. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's what I was presented with, and I did that kind of long story about the process of viewing him because I brought to it my feminist anger and I came away with a sense of his complexity and that's what we all are, and kind mm -hmm. of I think that's what he's trying to do with his cubist abstraction. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very easy to put 
an image in front of us that looks figurative and looks real mm -hmm. and think we've captured something. And I think it's the same with poetry. You know, sometimes we write what it seems, what seems to be straightforward narrative, mm -hmm. but actually for me, what poetry does is a step beyond that. It's that, first of all, it leaves room, it leaves white space for other people to jump into, but also it's constantly shifting and kind of has all these multiple meanings embedded within it. I, I'm really interested in what you said about I went to look for a different Picasso. Um, I think that's an incredible phrase, which makes me think about our conversation earlier with, with Jeremy and Nikita and Sana, where we were saying how when you take like a moral framework to an artist, you're essentially pitching your moral repertoire against their moral repertoire. Mm -hmm. And it's the idea of at what point do we part ways and at what point are we together? And it's a bit like actually when you go to a comedy night, you know, a comedian is technically supposed to be amoral. But if you go there with a kind of moral framework, you're going to fall out with a comedian. Mm -hmm. But it's at what point do you fall out? Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting how all of us, we take our life experience and our principles mm -hmm. and our convictions. And when we go to art, we all have a cut off, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. depending on who it is that we're mm -hmm. engaged with and what's happened to us, mm -hmm. you know? So I think looking for a different Picasso is a really interesting way of like, right, I'm going to leave the paedophile alone <laughs> and I'm going to go and look for someone <laughs> who was more politically uh, mm -hmm. minded and then kind of, you know, yeah, it's really, uh, that, that's a really mm -hmm. interesting way of... Mm. Mm -hmm. But also <laughs> that, that yeah, but also that, I mean, it was a challenge to me, like, not to be that moral judge either, because we're all, like, we've, we've, all, we've all got our own hypocrisies and we've got, all got our own complexities. And to give him credit, like, he didn't go there with that girl. He drew her. Um, and what is that doing in its own way? Mm. Well, Mm. I guess that's the question though can, but, yeah. but can you divorce the two yeah so that's, so that's what we were talking about now we're back we to just the first had, yeah, discussion we just had a panel about this yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I th that's got to be right <laughs> oh sorry no 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 that's okay no, no, I was just going to say, I think, I think Anthony's question was gorgeous, just that actually, mm. the, just picking up the language on the different Picasso, that wha what he's speaking to is the multiplicity of selves that we all have. Mm. And I think for that to be held um, is really tricky when it comes to art or when people have committed harms, because, you know, what happens is there's this kind of documentation of the harm and that becomes the character you mm -hmm. know the bad behavior becomes the badness becomes the bad individual and we lose sight of all of all of the multiplicity all of the plurality all of the complexity mm -hmm. um, and so there's something in that question that is so beautiful because it's it's a reminder that there is always more and there are always I think there are always contexts and conditions mm -hmm. that are also in relationship with the harm that's caused. It's not just about the individual. It's not just about disposing of the individual or disposing of the individual's mm. art. It's actually how can we be in relationship with this, with its complexity, and still be attuned to the fact that this is dis there's discomfort in the fact that this man was drawing like that was moving like a paedophile. I mean, let's let's call it. You know, there was, there were certain behaviours in that. If that you did that now, it would be pretty. Fruity. Yeah, right, no, yeah. it would, and but it's like, how can we, how can we hold that reality that that is what happened, and it's extremely uncomfortable, mm -hmm. and does that mean that you know that's all that Picasso was, or that Picasso didn't make incredible art? No, it's that we, we can hold all of that together. There's a, there's um, there's another, sorry to jump, yeah, no, jump go on, so I'm going to end up forgetting, but there's another element to all of this, and we didn't talk about it in the last one, but I thought the idea of were they moralists. Like, this is a huge part of art making. Is the mm. artist a moralist? So you have someone like Charles Bukowski, right, who was pretty hideous in all capacities, but he gets away with it because he never put himself forward as a moralist. He never mm. said, I am the paragon of all things mm. great. <laughs> he actually says, I am a reflection of a broken mm. system. Mm -hmm. Here I am. Make of it what you will. Mm -hmm. So, mm. I And that's not justifying or legitimizing the artist, I'm saying that if they never put themselves, like a politician mm -hmm. is scrutinized because they are supposed to uphold a system of morality, mm -hmm. whereas these artists do not. They're, and that's not in the remit, you see. Mm -hmm. But 
that's the other thing. I think that's fascinating yeah. what you're saying because that is also us reading in a way where we assume that art is making a statement. Yeah. And I think the thing that I've noticed from your poems and I hope from mine as well, and I think I found that from Picasso's paintings, is that it's actually about asking questions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's a very different thing. It's not, you know, polemic and it's not journalism and it's not didactic. kind of... Yeah, it's not, exactly, it's not didactic. It's to say, how can we carry this emotion or this vision of the world? Is it a vision of the world you share? You know, not this is the vision you should have, mm -hmm. but here is a vision I have. What does that do for you and how do you respond to it? Mm -hmm. Do you think that by reproducing images that show people in particular, in a particular light or in a particular kind of centrality, is that reinforcing or reinstating systems of violence against people who are already in a very precarious position? I mean, I, I think, again, I think we've got to ask the question. And my cre I mean, one of my bigger cuisinesses with Picasso, and actually I had it for a moment with using the pantoum, <laughs> is not his treatment of women, but his use of African masks. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, again, when I was kind of trying to push against it and explore more, um, there was a fantastic black artist, Faith Ringgold, who I found out I was a, an exhibition of her work. And I was really struck by the blurb um, in the catalogue which quoted her, where she'd been inspired to paint black women from her community by seeing Picasso's African masks on display. And I was like, hang on a it's minute. The other way around. It's yeah. the other way yeah, around. Yeah, because, I mean, again, in, I mean, if we did move the conversation mm. on from his treatment of women to his appropriation, mm. appropriation of, yeah. of African mm. masks, that was actually very radical. Yeah. yeah. It was seen in Paris as mm. being, I mean, the colon it was the colonies. We're seeing it in France now. The, the French view of Africa mm -hmm. yeah. is as a subspecies. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea that a, a, a group yeah. of major, it wasn't just Picasso, there were several of them, yeah. were influenced so mm -hmm. much by mm -hmm. African, what was seen as African culture. Absolutely. It might have been a very shallow idea of it, mm -hmm. uh, but they were influenced enough to make that central to their art practice mm -hmm. was shocking yeah. to the mm -hmm. art world. Mm -hmm. So. Again, it's a nuanced, it's a, you it's have it's to understand a nuanced yeah. point of view that it's not, appro uh, it's not just about the appropriation, it's about the radicalness. Yeah. Mm. Well, I guess it could be both at the same time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also in the cultural currency that comes with it as well, because mm. if an African painter was to do that, right. no one would take him seriously, mm. but Picasso rocks up and does it, and yeah, now yeah. he's at ease. But then if he goes on and inspires a woman of colour to paint. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Then but then the assumption in that is that a woman of colour needs to be inspired by Picasso well, well, or that, that she yeah. can't produce her own. Yeah, yeah. That's what yeah. Yeah. I don't think it was that she can't, but mm. that she chose to use it. I mean, but I think we've got to ask those questions. Like, yeah. what am I doing as a white Jewish woman using a Malaysian form? Mm -hmm. Except it's a Malaysian form that's come through French. And kind of my feeling as a woman was, well, if Baudelaire and Apollinaire and Victor Hugo can do it, then I have every right to mm -hmm. <laughs> as well. So is that like a political statement and a reclamation? Mm -hmm. I think or am I being just as abusive? No, I think it's about I mean? acknowledging where these things stem from, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. Like, and not trying to, you know, when you go and learn a martial art you know that the martial art originates from a particular part of the world mm. and I think it's how I guess from fashion to language I mean this isn't my language of mm. my ancestors like yeah. this is for me a colonized language like mm. I'm using English but it's not what my grandparents spoke so I think it's about acknowledging where that comes from but also the transference of cultural capital yeah. mm -hmm. through systems of appropriation yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, can I just um, the ask the audience again just because I'm aware that the Although we're having a fascinating discussion up here, uh, if there's anyone who wants to chip in at this point, because we are, we are coming a little bit closer to the end of our session. Is there anyone who wants to make any, uh, sorry, I did say no comments. I will say if you want to make any general comments or ask any questions, uh, now would be a great time. There's somebody right at the back. <laughs> Akita <Akita> Gill. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Um, <laughs> I actually wanted to talk to Sana about the acrobat and the, the poem that you sure, came up with. Sure. Um, there's a real sense of uh, suspension 
mm-hmm. in you know in, in in darkness that the acrobat has to go through where they're like way on top of people and there's this massive sense of suspension i kind of felt like that with your poem mm. where it's you know you're walking the tightrope of like life and death you're walking the tightrope you mentioned depression mm-hmm. and that sense of isolation of being suspended in something above mm-hmm. something seeing it mm. um could you talk a little bit more about that i don't think i can do it better than you just did babe <laughs> <laughs> Poets just coming in. No, it's gorgeous. Thank you for that. It was, it's a really lovely and beautiful interpretation. And um, I think there is something, isn't there, about kind of how sadness swallows. Uh, it can be so engulfing um, in which you do feel like you're watching through life through a bit of a screen. Um, and when you're kind of in relationship, everything feels slightly disconnected. And even, even when we're in company, we can feel so deeply isolated. Um, with our own emotionality, and I think, I think there's something in that that does. I think I, I really appreciate the language of suspension because, in it, is that is the kind of you're communicating that we will be re- relieved, <laughs> that there will be a release. And I think um, I actually, even though I've used the language of depression in, in this, you know, I don't particularly prescribe to a diagnostic framework um, of understanding our suffering because I think sometimes it fixes us into believing that this is what it is and it will be, and this exists within us as an individual, within my own biochemistry. Um, And I think that obscures the systems that are around us and how we're constantly in relationship with the worlds that we live in, and so are our emotional worlds. So inevitably, our emotional worlds are fluid and ever-changing, and the ways that we feel will also shift. And so there's something about what you said, Nikita, about suspension. It's like, Yes, at times I will be immersed in this really engulfing sadness, this misery and despair within the context of this world where people are dehumanized and can't move to safety and will be brutalized and murdered. Of course, I feel a a deep sadness to that. And and at the same time, there might be the possibilities of relief through through connection. And, you know, I guess there's something in kind of... um, you know, the question, I worry this life is wasted on me, I think is, although there's a, there's a real dis, a despair to that, right? Of course there is. But I think it does, there's also something hopeful in that question, which is h- how can we think about what a meaningful life is? Mm-hmm. You know, what, what does it mean to really show up and be alive in a loving way in relationship? That, that means that not, I don't only show up in the fullness of my humanity, but the fullness of your humanity matters to me. The, the humanity of the two-year-old refugee who's lying on the shore, it matters to me, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I, I do, I, I'm kind of, now I'm just talking in it for the sake of talking, but <laughs> thank you for that really gorgeous invitation. There's, a, there's um, a, 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 one of my favorite paintings of the 19th century by Degas, uh, which I think it's from about 1863, mm-hmm. is from uh, the circus that Picasso began to frequent 30 years later, 40 years later. Uh, and it depicts um, a, a mixed race performer from the circus called Miss Lala, who is her circus performance involves her holding on, suspended way above the ground, holding on by her teeth. Mm. and she became a a, a massive star and she actually ended up touring into England she came to the north Mm. of England Um, and the issue the kind of things that we're talking about and the issues around that there's so much in that because Mm. it it's it's both it's a circus act Mm. uh, it's also her livelihood it's also looks like a gag so Mm. it's almost like she hasn't got a voice, but she's got a performance, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and obviously her ra- her, you know, her race, and the way she was portrayed was, uh, mm-hmm. uh, and marketed was a, as kind of like African queen, you know. Right. She was representative of like a whole culture. It's, a f- it's just a fascinating um, piece that mm-hmm. that um, you know, if you if you are you know interested in mm-hmm. uh, the art in in France of that era. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, as I say, prefigures Picasso by forty years. Mm-hmm. Miss Lala. Someone used the word suspense. You know, there's a suspension. Suspension. Yeah. suspension. And I think what's interesting, particularly in the circus, is suspension works in kind of you know, it's performing double duty. 
because you've got the suspension, the literal suspension of someone hanging in the air, but then you've got the suspense if they're going to die mm. and if they're not going to die. Mm. So I think the circus is a space for precarity mm. where lives that would essentially be on the ropes are up there mm. playing it out mm. for us mm. to see if they're going to you know, do the tightrope or whatever. You know. yeah, yeah. It's an interesting wow. space. Mm. I just wanted to pick up that mm. last question. Like, is this life wasted on me? Mm -hmm. Because it made me think, I, do, I don't know if it was an influence of the James Wright poem, which ends, know. so he has this poem which ends, I have wasted my life. Oh. And Mary and I think Wild it's, and, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of poems. But yeah. that's such an interesting inversion mm -hmm. about, is this life wasted on me? Mm -hmm. So it's uh, that kind of precarity, but also mm -hmm. that question of what is my responsibility? Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, it's not, it's not just about me anymore, and I thought that was a really beautiful thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Forrest Gander's got a line, you who were given a life, what did you make of it? Mm. At the end of a poem, that I think mm. I always think about that. And mm. I think it riffs off the Mary Oliver, which, you know, so yeah. it's all kind mm -hmm. of, they're all working in the same yeah, 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 existential, yeah. what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah you the introduced existential me to what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so any other audience uh, contributions? I just want to, can I yeah, add something? Um, so I had a form of this poem and then I looked at it with this guy here. <laughs> and, and, and he really helps me to really kind of flesh out this thing about how can the language move to birth different ideas. Mm -hmm. And I just want to acknowledge um, Anthony. Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah, man. yeah, yeah. thank you very so much. Um, <laughs> I'd like to finish, if, if the poets are happy just to read their poems one more time, mm -hmm. yeah. would you... Can you find yours on your phone again, Anthony? Yeah, yeah, sure. You too, Would you like to go first? Yeah, I can do, yeah, sure. Yeah. Is depression and anger turned inwards? Everyone I love wants more, and my piss is copper. The toilet roll finished last Monday, just before the radio announced 300 Pakistanis were packed below deck into a death made reasonable by immigration policies. A toothy sea stretches itself towards yesterday's news. From the safety of my bed, I'm prizing open a white tulip, shouting on love that isn't. Like God gouging a slow Friday for gratitude. It's been a year since last summer and rage is still a Gucci coat I can't afford to wear. Honey, point that hot arrow back inwards. Murk a juicy gut. It's raining blue ticks, and kindness is on the other side of the equator. Interiority splayed across screens whilst the watchers shovel popcorn. We've been watched into watching. Hypervigilance thumbs a heart. It feels red. I can't smell my own blood from here. Liberation is pitying us, balled up over immortality's theatre. Fuck, I broke my own knee by mistake, or was it yours? All this unacknowledged hurt is rotting in the back garden. Who hasn't listened to the low murmur of a pulse knocking after a few weeks of morning's chubby heat? I am copy and pasting myself, like sweaty headlines in another room, another land, a two-year-old, lays face down on the shore, sneakers on tiny feet. I worry this life is wasted on me. Mm -hmm. Anthony? Blue guitar, old man. Drooped in its year, a rude crucifix drained of weight. His lowness, its manifesto, anemic and splintered, Discord reaching for the harsher strokes of an old man's unbending. Two triads of confession. Who here can play the epicenter of his terror? A torn femur, a mule's genius bearing the thirst a penny saves for its well. The hollow of a guitar sings to both grave and womb. Old man, look back at me. Unpick your life, your language for purpose here. A small score to push into resolve. Before we go... One more sustained note for the next movement's blue turn. Mm. Thanks. Blue nude. 
when I view her nude back floating in its sea of blue, I think of how scientists teach us that the body is almost all water. And a poet I love says it's the shape of grief, fog turning to mist, storing and summoning. I think of how scientists teach us that our bodies are made up of trillions of cells, each capable of growth, of grief, of storing our memories, of summoning responses to stimuli, of reproducing, how each of us is made up, each capable of growth, of reflecting from a thousand different facets, cubist, transforming in response to stimuli, to light, how each of us is a painter, reproducing our vision of life, how each of us is a muse, a die landing by chance on a different facet, shaped by the throw of a hand, that hand carving a brush through air, producing a vision of life. We are seen from behind in ways we can never know, our eyes facing only forward, weighing the throw of our hands how they carve through the air. And air, like our bodies, is almost all water, and the shape of our eyes is the shape of grief, for we can never know her, although we view her nude back floating in its sea of blue. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to read the f uh, final couple of pages of Adventure Everywhere, Pablo Picasso's Paris Nightlife. Um, uh, you don't need any, uh, any information other than what we've gleaned uh, during this really brilliant discussion. I've so enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. Thank, thank you for So open, yeah. open and nuanced and, you know. Mm. I'm dying to do a wee. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I know, but I can't. I'm mic'd up. You're going to hear it all happening. <laughs> um, so this is me kind of uh, looking back uh, 120 years and uh, retracing some of the steps of uh, Picasso and his, his, his crew of interesting people. Every generation has its years of hunger and creativity, courage and daring. Every generation makes its own culture finds its own cafes, pubs, clubs, coffee bars, greasy spoons, cheap gathering spaces, and takes on the world, armed with fervent iconoclasm, and desperate for new forms of expression, though sometimes also with one eye on what the past can offer as ammunition for revolutions to come. The lesbian hangout, the Hanaton, is now a cosmetic store. Zoot has disappeared. Most of the ground floor of the Cirque Medrano is a Carrefour supermarket. Where the Rat Moor stood is now a building housing a branch of the LCL Bank. It's been through many changes, but the basic shell of the Café de la Place Blanche is intact. It's now a Five Guys hamburger restaurant. Strip clubs and prostitution still flourish in Montmartre and Pigalle, and criminality associated with the vice trade is rife. In addition, Pigalle has a modern way to monetize sexual desire involving plastic and batteries. Shops like Sexodrome, which sounds like a David Lynch film, but is actually a huge sex toy superstore on three floors. In 2019, I spent a month living above a sex shop on the Boulevard de Clichy. That is a whole nother story. <laughs> <laughs> Directly opposite was a Monoprix supermarket in a building that now stands on the site of the demolished nightclub L'Enfer. I went shopping in there once every few days, usually in the bland light of the morning. I like to hold on to the thought that all of Montmartre's past is contained somewhere in its present. That Fernand Olivier, Modigliani, Josephine Baker, Jacqueline Lambert, Apollinaire, Lee Miller, Freddy Gerard and Johnny Thunders a partying in some dimly lit room up some steep stairs somewhere. But at the checkout queue in Monoprix, 
Nothing of the excitement of those nights at Long Fair lingered in the air. On other occasions, though, especially at night, you can turn a corner in Pigalle or Montmartre and time twists and rolls back. Visit Madame Arthur on the right night and you might find yourself in a riotous gin fueled event hosted by Sophie Morello, the queen of the lesbian DJs, described by one of her friends as having a heart as wide as a procession of revolutionaries. Sophie Morello's regulars throw themselves on top of each other, creating a sapphic pyramid that doesn't quite reach the ceiling, and then on stage in a gorilla costume, a lesbian reads 19th century French love poetry. Just down the hill from Sacré-Cœur, cigarette smokers and whiskey drinkers crowd outside a bar booming out John Lee Hooker. Other music is coming from under an unremarkable door opposite where Van Gogh lived on Rue Le Pic. The signs of another late night party in the hidden workshops behind the estate agency. Lock eyes with the greatest dancer. A bottle of something special comes out. The extravagant dresser turns heads. An anarchist picks up a guitar. The rhythm of the night takes hold, a rhythm centuries old. The noise, the bodies of strangers close, the dance, the party, the potential. You meet a poet on the walk home as dawn breaks. A new day. Apollinaire is waiting. He's talking Italian. You're in the zone. You'll wake up, eyes and mind blurry, but with a determination to never let the adventure end. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the festival, please subscribe, share this episode with others and leave a rating. Don't forget to mark your calendars as the Bradford Literature Festival returns for its 10th year from 28th of June to the 7th of July 2024.